Buju. Uh, good morning. I hope everybody got enough rest last night. We are going to hit the ground running, and we are going to cover a lot of content. We're going to go in-depth with statistical analysis for... I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. You're going to have that time to do that in the other sessions. But what we're going to do during this chunk of time is focus on you, the delivery of all the great service that you are trying to impact your communities with to support your families and children. Uh, I'm originally from Muskegon, Michigan. I'm a tribally enrolled member of the Ottawa Nation. Um, and one of the things that I've found in working with groups like yours for a lot of years, and uh, Shannon and I go back quite a ways too, um, is this is, these are my favorite groups to work with because this is where the givers gather. Uh, people who have big hearts, who are giving it all away, trying to impact their community, their families, their children in a positive way. The intentions are always there, but sometimes the execution gets a little bit wonky. Do you ever find that to be true? Just when you think you got everything figured out, what happens? Are you guys awake? <laughs> you guys are killing me right now. Okay, here's what I want you to do really quickly. I want you to say two words, Uga. Chuka. Uga. Chuka. Now I want you to say it in repetition. Ready? Uga, chuka, uga, chuka, uga, chuka. You already are giving up on me. <laughs> okay, again. Uga, chuka, uga, chuka, uga, chuka. Keep going. I can't fight this feeling. Deep inside of me. Keep going. I stayed up way too late last night in Kansas City. Oh my gosh. This is just, this is gonna be one of those mornings. Here we got some blood flowing. This is gonna be one of those mornings. I always love this when I go to a session and, and I'm coming in behind a group of people. And you always got like the little groups, everybody kind of clicks out with their little home communities and everybody's walking in. And somebody undoubtedly has a cup of coffee and they're, they're kind of leading the pack and they're like, come on, Margaret, let's go get motivated. <laughs> you know, and they're like, I'm like, I'm going to have a tough time today. So, well, I was saying before, we did our little song intro, was sometimes we, we think we have everything figured out and then things change. It's a dynamic we're all going to have to deal with for the rest of our lives, the rest of our careers. The better we learn how to manage that, the more effective we are in what we do in delivering great service to the people that expect it from us. Uh, and we all have those moments where we get humbled all over again. Things change, environments change, and then we have to kind of relearn some stuff or maybe learn some new things. And, and it's a humbling experience. Uh, I, I've had many of these over the years. Uh, one in particular that I, that I still remember a couple years ago, I was coming home, and I travel quite a bit for what I do, and there's no better feeling, and you're going to have this when you go home too, of going home to your family. It's the best feeling. When I go home and I, I get to see my wife and my two daughters again, and I get excited even before our, the plane lands. And we were coming in, I was on a two-legger, and we were coming into Chicago. That was the first part of the journey home. And there was a guy sitting across the row from me. He was in the window, and I could see his face was highlighted in the, in the city lights. And all the lights in the cabin were dark, and there was nobody between me and him. And I look over there, and I see him, and he's kind of rocking like this in, in the window. And I said, oh, I know what that is. He's celebrating that he's coming home. He's looking at the lights. He's thinking about home, and he's celebrating a little bit. And I said, I'm going to help this guy out. And I look over there, I give, him the, I give him the nod, and I start doing it to him, like, oh, yeah. Oh. And then the cabin lights come on, and he's looking at me, and all he's doing is coiling up his headphones. <laughs> Felt like such a knucklehead. Had to look away for the rest of the flight. But we have so many of those moments, and the, and the key is we're all trying to figure this out. We're trying to align our talent, our ability, the opportunity, so that we can truly be of service in a deep and real way with the people that we have signed up to serve. And like I said, the intentions are always there. Uh, I've never worked with, you know, the, the groups that are here, you have big hearts, and you want to do everything that you can to impact these families and children. And I get that, and I'm a huge fan of what you do. Uh, and I say this lovingly, 
is this is what we're going to talk about today, is, it, is all of you in here are, are crazy people. And I say it lovingly because you say the craziest stuff I have ever heard. Because we talk about, you know, managing our resources right and taking good care of us and being in alignment and, and being clear and taking ourselves off autopilot and being very conscious of how we use our resources and how we manage ourselves. And I hear these things, especially in the self-care realm, and I hear this, you know, we get done doing the programs and people go, DJ, this is great stuff. I'm going to use this. I'm going I'm to take better care of myself on the journey ahead next year. When this grant gets fulfilled, when this project is over, when this conference is done, when the kids grow up, you know, I, don't worry about me. I've got a vacation scheduled for the year 2036. I'm going to be good. <laughs> and we wonder why we run into the problems that we run into. So what I want to do during the time that we have together during these couple hours this morning is get you back to a place of clarity uh, where you're operating from a place of strength where you're using the scarce resources that you have available every single day. The stuff that we're going to cover is not rocket science. I don't think anybody here is looking for a more complicated model of anything, are you? More complicated model of parenting? More complicated model of leadership? I, I see three people shaking their heads no. The rest of you, that's what you signed up for, huh? Oh my gosh, you guys. We live in a complicated enough age as it is. You know, the speed of life is a speed of light. It's hard enough just to keep up, let alone grow ourselves, our programs, or impact our community. We have to do that consciously. We have to be aware of what's going on around us and learn how to say no to some of the stuff that isn't serving. Uh, so that's the first promise I make you. Nothing that we're cover covering today is going to be rocket science. Uh, the second thing I want to make sure that you understand is everything that we are going to cover comes from a basic standpoint. The fundamentals are still valid in the world that we live in today. Despite the complexity, despite the high pace and the high tempo, the fundamentals are still there for us, and that is good news in a complicated world. I'm a huge fan of traditional wisdom. I always have been. My grandma taught it and our traditional language back home in Michigan, uh, but I've got a lot of surrogate grandpas and grandpas, uh, grandmas and grandpas across Indian country that are still teaching it today. I've worked with 496 tribal nations in the last 23 years. And everywhere I've gone, I've gotten another piece of the puzzle to how life could work, maybe even on how life should work in a complicated age. And that's good news for us. And so we're going to focus on the basics, the fundamentals, uh, digging in with what we've got right now to create what we want to see in a service environment. Because I know why you're here. I know you want to give the best that you have every day to impact your people in a way that lasts. And I want to help you do that. So is everybody tracking so far? Seven of you. Okay, that's good. The numbers are going up. So we've got our handy clicker here, and I want to make sure that we've got, there we go. All right. That's the way to get a hold of me if you ever need to. The website right there. I've got uh, articles on there that you can use, borrow at will, use them in your communities with your tribal newspapers. You've got my permission to do that. Um, and we're adding to it all the time. So that's a great resource that's, again, free. I'm a big believer in free tools. Okay, I'm originally from Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, our tribe, Ottawa, the way that we got our name is ridiculous, and I want to share it with you really quickly right now. We had a vibrant trade network set up with all the tribes in the area and all the European nations that had made it across the Atlantic, uh, and we had this great, successful industry. And in the early 1600s, the French came and discovered us. <laughs> Who laughed? Free book. Come find me this afternoon. She got the joke. They didn't discover us. We were already there doing our thing. And they came to our people, and they were impressed at what they saw. And they were a little bit jealous. Typical French. I always picture how this went down. Big floppy hat, peacock feathers, white tights, buckle shoes. I don't know that they were wearing that, but that's the movie I play in my mind. And they came up to our leaders, and they asked a simple question. They said, Excuse me, monsieur, please, come, come. Um, who are you? Well, we didn't speak French. They didn't speak our language, so we totally blew the question. We thought they asked, what are you doing? So we answered. We said, Odawa, which in our language means to trade. And they go, sacre bleu, you'll be Odawa. And they wrote it down, we're like, no. 
and they wrote it down. We've been known for that ever since. And I think, what a dumb way to get named as a people. The first thing they catch you doing, God forbid, you're known for that for all time. Think about that. That could have gone so much worse. I'm waiting for the coffee to kick in. You guys are really slow on the uptake this morning. Could have come across us while we were in the bushes. There you go. 400 years later, you go to a big gathering, a gathering of nations, Denver March Powwow. What tribe are you? Kiowa. What tribe are you? Lakota. What tribe are you? Peepee -pee tribe. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Could have gone a lot worse. But I know that my people were the original successful business owners in the state of Michigan. So for me to own and operate my own business as I have for many years once I left the military does not feel like a stretch out of my culture. I feel like I'm honoring it. We call ourselves Anishinaabe, which means the people. Um, but I'm very proud of that aspect. We adapt, we change. And there's some of those timeless principles in our culture that go back to the basics, the fundamentals over and over and over again. They're relevant, they're impactful, and they are force multipliers in the work that we do in service to others on a daily basis. And sometimes those resources are so basic, they fly under our radar. All the tribes that I've worked with in the last 20, almost 25 years now, I have never encountered a tribe that said, you know, if we would have had what that other tribe had in resources, we would have been so successful at what we did as a people. I have never heard that. Every tribe, every native community that I've worked with, whether it's up near the Arctic Circle where it's 40 below zero and 60 mile an hour winds, whether it's down in the wetlands of Florida where the moment you start to build something, it starts to rot away, whether it's out in the desert in the southwest where it's 115 degrees in the summer and there's no water, every tribe I've worked with dug in with what was in their own backyard to create success. And I am convinced that we can do the same things with our agencies, with our teams, and with ourselves. If we know what it looks like and we keep fighting for it. That tribal-centric way of thinking is using the basic stuff that we have in us and around us to create what we want to see, which goes back to the title, Victory by Design. It's not called Victory by Hope. It's not called Victory by Wishing for something real hard to happen. It's not called Victory by Waiting for the perfect timing, perfect mix of resources, perfect cast of, of personnel and support. It's about digging in with what we have right now in us and around us every day to create what we want to see in the service we provide others. It is a very forward-leaning approach, and it, and it makes sure that we are not waiting for anything. We're using what we have, not waiting for the economy to improve, not waiting for all the pieces to come together just so, but digging in with what we've got right now. And, and that's really, at the end of the day, what our people have signed up for to get from us. Would you agree? If you agree, just say, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why your people come to you. You have the resources. You have the guidance that they're looking for, the impactful stuff that you have to offer. We can't lose sight of that. They want, when they come to you, they want the best you can provide. They don't want the best under the circumstances. I think our people deserve more than that, and I know that you do too. They deserve our best. Our children, our families deserve our best. And if we're going to deliver that, we have got to keep that victory by design mentality intact. An example from the fashion world, Nawe Olin. I don't know if you've ever heard of that company. This is a company that took this idea and ran with it. They basically use resources that are around that people think so little of, they actually discard it. They actually use candy wrappers. Have you heard of this company before? They use candy wrappers, sometimes up to 4,000 candy wrappers they bind and weave. And it's from a Mayan tradition that says use regular stuff that you see every day to create something new. And they bind these candy wrappers into handbags. These things sell for hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars. And it's basically using resources that are readily available, free. Things that people look on as so common, they actually discard them and don't think about them at all. And we've got to make that mental shift. Take the autopilot off. We live in a world today now where so much allows us to not think. Would you agree? Yeah. Allows us to be on autopilot. 
where we stop looking at things through a different lens. We're just kind of going through the motions. And we're surrounded by things like that. It's up to us to take autopilot off and say, what do I have to work with right now? Who do I have that I can seek support from or get answers from? We have to be aware of that every day. You know, we're in that world now where so much is automated. I, I get caught with this too, and I, and I talk about this stuff. I was at a conference. I was in between sessions. I went to the one restroom that had, they had set up for the guys, and it was a small restroom, and it had uh, one sink. And so use the restroom and stand there in the sink waiting for, you know, everything is automated now, right? Toilets flush themselves. Water comes out when you put your hands under. And I went, I did that, and I went to the soap dispenser. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Finally, the three guys that were building a line behind me, one of them got really impatient, stepped in front of me and said, look, man, you just pump it. You get burned with that stuff. Take the autopilot off. Be aware of what you have to work with on a daily basis. Don't let those basic resources slide by because a lot of times at the end of the day, we have what we need. Um, and this is step one, and this is the hardest step sometimes to make is the mindset shift uh, that we all need to make. And one of them in particular that I've seen do damage in communities, I've seen do damage um, over the years, and I hate this concept of where you have somebody who's in a leadership position, somebody who's in a community service position, and they have an attitude where we talk about these ideas on how to improve things, how to adjust the knobs, how to better use our funding, how to better use our folks that we have available to do this mission with. And yet, at the end of all that, they say, well, these are great ideas, but you have to understand something, DJ. It's just like that around here. You ever hear that? Oh, I hate that. And I try not to hate anything because hate takes energy. I get it. And we treat hate like a four-letter word in my family. It is a four-letter word for those of you who haven't had the coffee kicked in. But we treat it like that. Whenever I say that in our house, my daughters rat me out. If I say hate, my daughters go, ooh, I'm telling mom. So I try not to hate things, but I hate that one. Because the moment somebody says, especially somebody in a leadership position, which everybody in this room is, you are setting the tone in your communities. You are inspiring people. You're motivating people. Whether you do this by accident or on purpose is the only question. Make no mistake about it, you're having a huge impact in your communities back home. And when somebody in one of those positions says, it's just like that around here, that's just the beginning of the damage. Because it starts to come out. How does it start to come out? This is where you answer. <laughs> Nothing we can do. We're stuck. This is as good as it's ever going to be. This is just the way it is. This is just the way they are. This is just the way we are. Let me ask you a real quick question so we can just set this one to put this one away for good. Can we improve things? Can we make things better? We don't have to do it all today, but we do need to work on it every day. Because the moment we start to get stuck and we say goofy stuff like that, it's just like that around here. The danger with that is this. All of a sudden in that moment, it starts to come out in that person's language. It starts to come out in their behavior. It starts to affect the people around them. And all of a sudden, something terrible happens. The people around that person start to live down to lowered expectations. Does that make sense? And all of a sudden, second best isn't so bad. Then third best is all right. Fourth best is okay, because at least we're not as messed up as that other community up the highway. We hear this stuff, and then we wait till we scoop up the bottom of the barrel, hold up what's left, and have the nerve to say stuff like, that's just how it is around here. That's not how it is. That's how we're allowing it to be. There is a difference between those two concepts. And that first shift we have to make is we have to understand success in what we do in service is always around the corner. If we know what it looks like, if we keep fighting for it, and if we don't quit. 
Because the biggest threat, make no mistake about it, folks, the biggest threat to delivering great service to your families and children in your community is not a lack of resources. Those things will always be there. There will always be a lack of something. Would you agree? There's always going to be a lack of time, lack of personnel, lack of funding, whatever it may be. The biggest threat to delivering outstanding service and what you do daily is not a lack of resources, it's apathy. It's when we just stop fighting as hard. Where we just start to say stuff, even if we don't say it out loud, we start to mentally think, that's just how it is around here. And we need to do everything that we can to combat that for us and to help our people combat that too. What's the most powerful form of leadership there is? The only one that works. Everything I have ever learned in personal experience, the six teams of folks I led when I was in the active duty military, all the elders I've read, every book I've read, every personal experience in leadership, I can melt everything I have ever learned down to one line. Leadership by blank. Example. Works. Everything else is lip service. It starts with us. We have to make that mental shift so we can lead other people to higher ground. Uh, at the end of the day, and I'll tell you the, so, sometimes we already have the resources that we actually need, uh, but we're not thinking about the right use of them. Uh, we're complaining about what we don't have. You ever get caught in that trap? You have good stuff sitting in front of us, but we still focus on that thing that may or may not get funded. We still focus on the person we may or may not hire, the building that may or may not get built, and we start to focus on things over the horizon that may or may not happen at all. Meanwhile, you have a person sitting in front of you that you can impact. We lose sight when we're obsessing about the stuff out on the horizon we don't have a lot of control over. Uh, and, and sometimes we already have those resources that we need. They just don't come in the form we expect them to. They don't look the same way. They don't... Uh, feel the same sometimes, but it doesn't mean that they can't impact the work that we do daily. Years ago, I was traveling through Jacksonville, Florida. I was there for a conference, staying at the hotel, and I ran out of toothpaste. Not a national crisis, definitely an inconvenience. I went down to the front desk. I asked the person working there. I said, do you have a gift shop? Do you have some place that I could walk to and go get toothpaste because I ran out? And she goes, no, we don't have anything like that. She said, but I think I can help you out. And she started shuffling behind the desk, and she's looking for what I thought might be maybe a toiletry kit or something along those lines. And she finds what she's looking for, and she comes out, and she's just glowing. She's so happy she found it. She was so happy to give it to me. She didn't just give it to me. She presented it to me. It was like, oh. And I'm accepting. I'm like, oh, man, is that tiny. This is what she gave me. I know if you are more than 10 feet away, you cannot see this is an actual tube of Colgate toothpaste <laughs> built for a Barbie doll. <laughs> and when she presented it to me, I looked at this, and I got to admit, this is not what I expected. <laughs> this is not even to some degree what I wanted. <laughs> but this is exactly what I needed. And that's, where, that's the mental shift we have to make. I will tell you the painful truth, but it's the truth. We need to be honest about this stuff. You are never going to have all you want. You are never going to have all, the, all you want to do the work that you do. You will never have all the time. You will never have all the funding. You will never have all the personnel. And you will never have all the support. But if you look at what you do have... With that warrior spirit in action, you put your creative thinking caps on and you work together as a team, you can find a lot of times you have what you need. And that's the mental shift that we have to make. Your people need you, not next week, not next year, not when funding profiles change or whatever. They need you today. And if we're going to deliver the goods today, we've got to take an assessment of what we have to do it with, which is step two. Know your resources. If I was going to ask you to go across the street and build a house, at some point you're going to want to take a look at what? The land that you have to do it with. What else are you going to want to take an assessment of? You guys are already running out of answers like what, what she said. That was good enough. I was thinking that, the land. <laughs> what else are you going to take an assessment of? Materials. The materials you have to do this with. The raw materials, the resources. What else are you going to take an assessment of? 
The budget. You're going to want to take a look at the people you have to do this work with, right? You're going to want to take a look at your tools. You don't want to go across the street to build a house and look down at your toolkit and find all you've got in there is a plastic spork. That'd be a tough position to be in. The good news is nobody in this room, no matter how humble your resources are in that position, we have got great stuff we've got access to daily. And if we're going to improve, if we're going to make things better in our communities and for our children and families, we have got to take a clear-eyed view of what those resources might look like. So what I want you to do at your tables is work together as a group, and I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do this, is take an assessment of resources that you have access to, that you can use to do the work that you do daily. I want you to come up with at least seven. It could be more than seven, but at least seven. And I'll give you the first one because it's an easy one and everybody says this up near the top, the computer or technology. So you can't use that one, okay? We know it's a great tool, we'll talk about it in a minute. But I want you just to have a brief discussion for a couple minutes because we need to work together on this stuff. We're all here for the same reason. We want to improve our impact. This is where it starts. So take a couple minutes to do this. What resources do you have available that you have access to daily? Okay. We have some mic runners in the audience that are kind enough. They're, they're going to be uh, giving the mic to whoever would like to share an answer. Who would like to volunteer one of the resources that you came up with in your list of seven? Over, over here. Only we one? A, we had a list just of, one. of 13. OK, good, excellent. And um, I'll just uh, say other tribal CCDF grantees. Of other tribal yeah. CCF grantees. Yes. Is that a good resource to access? Yes. Absolutely, positively. Do we have time in life to make all our own mistakes? No, we don't. The answer, <laughs> she said it with confidence too. She goes, yes. <laughs> no, we don't. We've got to go to school on each other. We're, here to, we're all here for the same reason. We want to improve what we do. We want to improve the impact that we make. And if we have other resources and other people that are walking that path and can give us pointers, coaching tips, guidance, things to avoid, oh my gosh, that's priceless. We definitely want to use that as a resource. Who's got another one uh, over... Over here. Community roundtable, community leaders roundtable meetings monthly. Okay, community leaders, uh, community roundtables monthly. Would that be a good resource to access? Why would that be such a good resource to access? Get feedback. Get feedback. We all know the golden rule, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you guys softball questions here. But you, every time I ask a question, you guys are overcomplicating. It goes, he's trying to trick us. <laughs> we know what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? The platinum rule is one level higher. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. How do we know what that looks like for somebody else? <laughs> Again, not a trick question. Yes, we ask. And that's why roundtables like that in a community are so powerful. We're actually getting feedback on how we can better serve the people we're signed up to serve. Ah. What's another resource? Oh. Subject matter experts. Subject matter experts. And why is that so darn important? Because the reality is we don't know everything. We're never going to know everything. And we were just having this conversation. It's not important that we know everything. What's important is that we know where to find it. We all need outside answers. Would you agree? We all need outside resources. And when we have subject matter experts that we can tap into, I mean, that is a powerful uh, force multiplier right there. Knowledge is, is power, and not just knowledge is power, even more though, applied knowledge is power. You gotta remember that. Yes? I would say children, because we're always seeking to meet their needs. Okay, the children that you serve, because you're always seeking to meet the needs of seeking, them. Seeking to meet their needs. Okay, powerful resource. Do the children and the families that you get to work with on a daily basis teach you things to better do your job? Absolutely, positively, yes. I like it when a man asking these questions and four of you are like, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. What's another resource? 
snacks. Aho and amen. Snacks. Coffee. No, but the way that we fuel ourselves up, we need that too. Self-care is important in the work that we do. You know, if you're busy and you're giving it all away, we, we need to make sure that we are taking care of the source of all this wonderful service, which is us. We need to make sure that we take care of that. Uh, being able to provide those snacks not only helps our body, helps our mind. What's another resource that you have access to daily? Yes. Our group said stru a structured uh, organization. Structured organization. Is that important? To have a game plan in work or, or at work? Absolutely. When we stop prioritizing, if we don't have a clear structure, if we don't have a clear goal of what we're trying to hit, any target will do. When we have, when we have organization and we have structure, it gives us clarity on the path going forward. We need that. We live in a crazy enough world as it is, where we get scatterbrained so easily. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. That's a critical to our success. Who's got another one? A caring staff. A caring staff. Is that important in the work that you do? Absolutely. Our teammates, I mean, when we have a good team uh, that support each other, mutual support, they share ideas, they share resources, they keep each other up when somebody's struggling a little bit. I mean, this is like, it's not one plus one equals two. It, one plus one can equal four. And we're force multiplying. That's what, that's what that's called. So having a good team is critical. And one more? Our culture. Our culture. Important resource? Yes. Isn't that kind of the framework you want to overlay over the work that you do, under the work that you do, all around the work that you do, through the work that you do? The answer is yes. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, and give me one more. Uh, tribal Vital Records Offices. Tribal Vital Records Offices? How is that a resource? Especially with some of the families that come that don't have their tribal IDs. Okay. Um, or they know that they could qualify to be recognized um, by descendancy. Okay. So we have to make the... Um, have, have it in their files where we can show the descendancy as to why the child can qualify for the program. Got and it. And then okay. actually be able to get some of these families their federal recognition, mm -hmm. which is life-changing, from especially ones with protective services. Yeah, for the resources and benefits, absolutely. Okay. Are all these great resources to access? Yes, and there's many, many more. The point I'm trying to make with this is we should never, ever, ever, ever feel stuck. There are always answers, there are always resources that we can access, no matter how humble they may be. At the end of the day, it's not even what we have as far as resources, it's how we're using them that's gonna create the impact that we wanna create, right? One of the resources that didn't get mentioned in the list that I wanna focus on, the most important resource we have, time the most precious resource we have access to on a daily basis. And it's so basic, it flies under our radar sometimes daily. Time is the most important resource we have. Why? Because it's non-renewable. It's a non-renewable resource. Every other aspect of what we do and what we have access to is to some degree rebootable, rechargeable, regrowable to some degree. You can have a house, and God forbid it burns down, you can build a new one. The community we lived in for a lot of years that we moved from almost two years ago, Colorado Springs, Colorado, we had two wildfires within a couple years of each other that burned 502 family homes to the ground. We were almost one of them. The fires got within a mile of our front door. And every time I flew out of the springs, I was inspired as I looked down, as I saw a beehive of activity, people were putting the pieces to their life back together again. It's tough to do, but you can do it. You can have an opportunity, lose an opportunity, and find another one or create one. You can have a job, lose a job, you can get a job again. You can have money, lose money, you can get money again. Sometimes our health, we struggle with our health and we do things and make life changes and get our health back. Heck, you can even have love, lose love, and find love again. That's what 49s and Match.com are for, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> People are like, that's not where we met. Okay, fine, I won't push it. But time is the only thing that we ever spend that we never get back. That's why it's not just important, it is absolutely critical. We are putting it not towards everything, which is the temptation of the world we live in, isn't it? But we're putting it towards the right things. And if we never learn to determine which is which, we doom ourselves to chaos. We live in a busy world, folks. But the reality of it is, the way that we spend our time on a daily basis defines every aspect of what we do and the results we get. Where we put our time determines the quality of our relationships, the quality of our service and our performance, determines our level of happiness and health based on where we are putting this most precious resource on a daily basis. So we have, again, got to be clear-eyed about where we're putting this great stuff because what happens is if we don't have a focus on that, our time tends to go everywhere. Would you agree with that? A little bit here, a little bit there, and all of a sudden we don't have anything at the end of the day for the important stuff. We need to be aware that this dynamic is going on. Uh, it's critical we put it not towards everything, but towards the right thing. So here's what I want you to do again at your tables really quickly. I want, now we see this all the time. This is the living laboratory that we live in as human beings. We get to see good uses of time. Would you agree? And we get to see poor uses of time. Poor use of time is time that we put forward and we don't get anything or very little back in return. And we need to understand which is which. Because if we're going to improve the dynamic on how we spend time, we first, again, have to take a snapshot of what good, bad, sometimes ugly looks like when it comes to the way that we use our resources. So really quickly, again, as a group, a couple minutes, four good investments of our time, four poor uses of our time. Okay, and we see these every day. These should not be very hard to come up with as far as answers go. So go, go to it. I'm hearing some really, 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 really good answers. So if we can get the mic runners again out in the, in the crowd and whoever wants to give an answer. And, and that, the last person who, who gave an answer, I, I couldn't tell where she, was, where she actually was. That was weird because with the lights, so I just kept, if you saw, I kept shifting my eyes. I, I didn't, I still didn't know where, where she was, but. Okay, who's got an answer that they want to share? Uh, a good use of time, a good investment of our time. What's that? Reading. Reading. Is that a good use of our time? Yes, because we want to continue to add to our knowledge base, right? The more we know, the better decisions we can make. The more we know, the more we can offer somebody else. The power with collecting knowledge, and by the way, this is the traditional elder role in our communities, 101 right here. The role of an elder was to collect as much good information and wisdom as they possibly could, not for their own benefit, so they could benefit the people that were in their community and tribe. If I have a dollar and I give Shannon my dollar, that's a me or she kind of thing. But if Shannon has a really good idea and shares it with me, then we both have it. And the really cool part is we can both stand up and share it with everybody, and then we all have it. So school is not out for us, folks, ever. If we're serious about serving other people well, we have got to keep the doors of the schoolhouse open and continue to learn new ideas, new information, add to our knowledge base. And the only way that we do that is either through conversations with other people, readings, trainings, but reading is, is one of those powerful things uh, that we can do a little bit each day and keep adding, which is, which is great. That's sustainable too, by the way. Who's got another one they want to share? To be organized. Is that a good use of our time? Absolutely. Measure twice, cut once. When we're organized, when we go forward, we are a lot more efficient with the way that we use our good stuff. And that's why having a game plan is so critical to our success. Who's got one from, from back there? Yes, a good use. Communicating. Communicating. Communication, uh, does it, can it drive us crazy communicating with other folks? It can make us want to tear our hair out sometimes and make us want to tear their hair out too. <laughs> because when you get two people in the room and we put all of our spin and our background and our thoughts and beliefs into communication, it sometimes becomes challenged. But I will tell you this, 
your investment that you make in, in your communication within your team, within your community, for the work that you do and how you do it is one of the best investments you can make of your time and energy. Because when you get this down and you get better at it, and we can all improve, uh, you, you gather more support in the community, you have more free sharing of resources within a team, you help each other out, you deal with conflict so much better, but we have to practice this stuff. That is a great use of our time, communicating with uh, our team, our community, uh, and each other. Yes, in the back. Um, I've adapted a time use skill from a curriculum plan, a, a plan, do, and review. So you, it's a systematic approach to time management where you set aside and everyone knows there's a planning time. Okay. And then your day, you do your day, which can unravel, and then right. you review. And you do that with your management team on a regular basis. So it's a planned time management. Excellent. Because you're sticking the flag in the ground and saying this is a pre-designated time for planning. Because I, I love what she said, there, there's, it's never going to be convenient. There's always going to be stuff that comes up, and if we don't plan for it, it just gets taken over by other stuff. So those are some great uses. Hey, all right, we're getting light. Who's got some, now this is where it gets exciting. Who's got some poor uses of time that we see all too often? And by the way, the people who are most susceptible to these poor uses of time are also the ones who complain the most about not having time. So what do we tend to see as a poor use of time? Yes, in the back. Um, sitting around and chatting about what they did the last weekend and what they're going to do this coming weekend. <laughs> I even like the way you said it. Sitting around, chatting about what they did last weekend and what they're going to do this weekend. Yeah, and sometimes it makes the day go faster. But, I mean, having social time and, and being able to connect with our teammates is important. But how much time are we putting into that? Because if you're sitting around and just doing the water cooler talk for big chunks of time, that means somebody's not being served well in your community. We have to balance that stuff. And, and a lot of this, like I said, comes down to awareness. What do you got? Fretting over things you can't change. What's that? The first part? You're fretting over things. Fretting over things change. you can't change. How much time is lost in worry? How much time is, it, is lost in obsessing about something that may or may not happen that at the end of the day we don't have a lot of control over anyway? You know, those things make an exciting story. They get everybody all ginned up. But what it does is it takes our eye off of why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing, what we could be doing to impact somebody else. Uh, who's got another one? Poor use of time. I'm waiting we're for here. it. I'm, I got the drum roll going in my head right now. Okay, we I got heard it Indian mentioned. time. What's that? Indian time. For, Indian time. For good time. I'm not touching that one. So, okay, here we go. Here we go. Somebody said so, social media, surfing the internet. Do we see this happen a lot? We live in a day and age now that is unlike any that we've had before. We are literally surrounded by things that move at this speed and information overload is not the exception anymore, it is the rule. I read an article uh, earlier this year that made me exhausted when I read it. And it was about a, a kid who's in his late teens, I think he was like 18, 19 years old, and they were interviewing him, and this is what he said in the interview. He said, what I do, the way that I use social media is during the course of my day, I get on my Instagram uh, account and I check my feed. And then I check the feed, and then I post something, and then I move on to Facebook. And then I check my feed, and then I post something, and then I move on to Twitter, and I check my feed, and then I post something, and then I move on. Are you getting a pattern here? And he had about five, I think he had five social media platforms. He said, when I get to the end of that last one, I check my feed, I post something, now they've all refreshed, so I go back to Instagram. I mean, I laid my head on the desk and just was exhausted from reading that article. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the world we live in today. And we have to be aware. Now, technology it can be a great thing. Technology is a great tool. I'm not here to bash technology. I use it all the time in the work that I do. Technology is great for the right purposes. 
Technology is a great conveyor of data. But technology is not great for transmitting what? The things that you're building your relationships on in your communities and with each other, which is what? How do we build our relationships? Trust. How do we get trust with people that we work with? What do we have to invest? Time. And we build trust with other people, not with tech. We're at, we're at a, a very strange time right now, and especially for people who have dedicated their lives to service, I hope you're paying attention to these dynamics. Because we are in a really weird time in our society where we're using technology as a tool for everything now, including relationships. Where you see, you know, it used to be bad where people would get fired or broken up with via email. Now it's via text and with emojis. It's not even language anymore. It's just smiley face, tears, and thumbs up. That means you just got broken up with. But in all seriousness, I get done with my program sometimes, and people will come up to me afterwards, and sometimes very emotional, and, and openly admit they, that they're in this challenge, where they have 800 Facebook friends, and not one person they feel they can call and cry to. Not one person they feel they could ask to go have coffee with and they would get a yes. We're going through a dynamic shift. Technology can enhance a relationship, but technology should never substitute for one. And that's the blurred line that we're getting into. You know, your bread and butter and what you do in service is building good, strong relationships with who? This is not a trick question, folks. With people. And the way that we do that is by being able to invest the time and to have those conversations. And not some of the stuff we just can't farm out. You know, we're taking the most sacred endeavor of the human experience, which is our relationships to other human beings, and we're sometimes cheapening it, cheapening it with technology. You know, go spend that face time. A little bit it can go a long way. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But be aware of that. Um, Okay, you guys are giving me some great looks. I'm gonna start taking photos of you guys. I see, I look over at a table and they're all going. Okay, so here's the thing. I got bad news and good news. And just like in a medical setting, I'm gonna give you the bad news first. Uh, the bad news is we live in a day and age now where everybody and everything wants a piece of our time. Would you agree with that? A Little bit here, a little bit there. All of a sudden at the end of the day, we don't have any and we go, I don't have time. We have to be aware of where our time is going. I did an article a couple years ago, got a huge online response. The title of the article was called Candy Crushed. Guess what that article was about? And it came from uh, being at a conference, and I was in between sessions, and I was talking to three other guys about the challenges of living in the world that we live in today, especially if you're a, a husband and a father and have you know responsibilities to other people and we're all juggling balls. And one of them mentioned social media and we started talking about it and he said, yeah, he goes, it was just crazy. He goes, last week, last weekend, I got on Facebook to check on one friend at 10 o'clock in the morning. Just one friend. He said, I logged off at two. He said, it was like I fell into a wormhole. It was like, and it's two o'clock. And we started laughing about that. And one of them brought up the games on our phone. Uh, and one of them mentioned Candy Crush. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guy comes running over to our group and wanted to be par part of the conversation. We didn't know this guy, but he insisted on being part of it. And he comes trotting over. He can't get there quick enough. He comes sliding into our circle. He's like Kramer on Seinfeld. Hair's all puffy, eyes are wide. He goes, did you just say Candy Crush? We're like, yeah. He said, oh, my gosh, that game is awesome. I play it all the time. I just have to get to that next level. I play it so much. Last week, I forgot to pick my son up after soccer. <gasps> you should download it. <laughs> that was the next thing he said. I'm walking away. I'm like, no, nah, man, I, I don't want that game. I don't want that. I'm not look, looking for another black hole to throw my time into. I'm pretty sure you're not either. We're pretty stretched as it is. But that's exactly the dynamic that can happen if we're not aware of where our time is going. That's the day and age we live in now. We have to be aware of it. 
Um, the good news is, because time is the most precious thing we have, it's also the most precious thing we can give somebody else. Whether it be the children and families you serve, your teammates, your own family, or yourself. And a little bit can go a long way. Whenever I work with groups and, or teams and I say, you know, it's important to invest that time in your, in your teammates, to, to give that time. And even if people don't say it out loud, you, you can read it in their body language when I say you have to, you know, take more time to, to spend with these folks. And you get, the, you get this as a body language sign that something's not going right. And you go, ah. <laughs> because people are exasperated. We're already stretched pretty thin. But what's happening is in their mind, they're making this much bigger than it needs to be. Because when I say spend more time, for instance, with your teammates to build better relationships, to get to know each other more, to get to know your motivations, how you can support and help each other out. When, when I say spend more time, I'm not talking four hours of deep look into my eyes time. That's what people sometimes think. That's not what's required. A little parcel of time given the right way can change the entire dynamic of a relationship. A little bit can make a huge impact. I have learned this and relearned this many times in my life over the years, but especially working in an arena that I've served in for a lot of years, which is suicide prevention. Uh, it's taken a devastating toll in our native communities. It's also affected my life personally and my wife's life as well. And I will tell you, I've been to conferences over the years where some brave soul will stand up in front of 500 strangers and say things like this. 18 years ago, I decided to end my life. I felt hopeless. I felt stuck. I felt that nobody cared about me. And then I ran into blank. And you can fill in the blank. A teacher, a cousin, an auntie, a pastor, a, a coach, uh, a friend who said this to me. And it changed my mind. And those stories are always the same, folks. It's my uncle said this to me, a story, a one-liner, a check-in. Not my uncle sat me down for four hours of deep look into my eyes time. That was not what was required to have a massive impact in somebody else's life. A little bit, given the right way, can have that effect. But it's got to be given in the right way. And this is what gets violated. If it's going to be a good give of our time, even a small parcel, 15, 30 seconds, make it count. The way that we do that is by following these two guidelines. Number one, it has to be given while we're present, while we're fully present. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean a warm body standing in front of a warm body. We, we sometimes allow that to be connection all too often. What I'm talking about being present is you are there fully. You are there physically, you are there mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, even if it's for 15 or 20 seconds. What is not being present is what we see all too often. And folks, we're, especially in a, in a service arena, we are here to serve other human beings, Correct? Let's just all get on the same boat with that. We are here to serve other human beings. I don't worry about the next wave of technology, the next iPhone. I worry about the human-to-human -human interface. This is timeless stuff that doesn't change. Uh, but we have to be present when we give that time. Here's what's not being present, and, and see if this rings a familiar tone. You come in to see somebody. You have something on your mind, something on your heart. You need some answers. You need some support, some encouragement. You come to them, and they are doing this. And, they, and you come in and they say, no, no, go ahead. Tell me what's going on. I'm listening. <laughs> what? No, keep talking. I'm, I'm listening. Tell me, tell me what's happening. <laughs> what is that cat doing? <laughs> That's not being present. That's taking a moment to have an impact on somebody else's life and doing what Justin Timberlake did when he was the lead singer in sync and sang bye, bye, bye. Oh, a fan. We got a fan over here. And she was serious, too. I looked over, and she's like, mm, mm, mm. We had an opportunity to make an impact, and we missed it. It just disappeared. So we need to be aware of that. Be fully present when you give your time, even if it's a few seconds of time. Make it count. The second thing is when we give that time, 
We have to do it willingly. Now, this one can get violated pretty quickly when we're stressed, overwhelmed, when we're not focused on why we're here, or making that 15 to 20 seconds count. Uh, we get distracted. Sometimes we don't mean it. I get it. But if we're not giving it willingly, sometimes we say something in the heat of the moment in a second that we regret for a week. Have you ever had one of those moments? We've all had them. That's why we need to be aware of this stuff. When we talk about giving willingly, um, if you've ever had a moment where somebody gave you their time but did it unwillingly, I want you to think about how that felt. Because we see a lot of those moments in our society now where somebody, if you've ever had a moment where even if it was somebody's job to give you answers, give you support, guidance, whatever it may be, and they were unwilling to give you 10 seconds of their time, have you ever had that experience? At a health clinic, at a department store, on the phone, there's a lot of great places to get terrible service in our society. And if you've ever had that type of experience, how did it make you feel? Unimportant. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Irritated. Honest answer. We get upset. Is that, is that your experience? Did you, do you agree with that? How else does it make us feel? Somebody from back there in the back corner. I, I like when I do the back corner and everybody looks at each other, the other person. They're like, what? What? He means you. <laughs> How did it make you feel? unappreciated. So, so far, what do we have here? We have irritated, unappreciated, unimportant. What's another one? How else did it make you feel? I'm looking for something deeper. Mad. What's the other one? Worthless. Oh, my gosh. We're going to stop the list. It's getting ugly now. <laughs> Somebody just cut right to the core, said worthless. Ouch. Now, we just built a laundry list. Feeling unimportant, making somebody feel unimportant, irritated, uh, worthless. We're basically creating a laundry list of how we would never want somebody else to feel in our presence. Would you agree with that? If you agree, just say, mm-hmm. We would never want somebody to feel unimportant, worthless, irritated in our presence. And if you can make that one pivot to make a commitment to the best of our ability that we would never make somebody feel like that in our presence, your service model based on that one pivot alone will shoot through the roof. And I say to the best of our ability, why? Because we are human beings, folks, and we sometimes screw it up. Sometimes we're overstressed, we lose focus, we say something in a hurry, like I said, that we say in a second, we regret for a week, it can happen. But to the best of our ability that when somebody is in our presence, we are not we're doing everything we can so they don't feel irritated, unimportant, or worthless, but that they feel honored. And it doesn't take four hours of deep look into my eyes time to do that. But we have to give that time willingly. I was at a department store where I had one of these experiences. And I'm not going to tell you the name of the store. People always try to get me to say it. DJ, where did this terrible experience that you had happen? Tell me. No, I'm not going to tell you. Sometimes people wait till the meeting's over. They'll meet me on the hall. Okay, DJ, the meeting's over. You can tell me. Where did this happen? I'm not telling you. I'm not going to tell you the name of the store, but I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with Schmalmart. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to give you the name of the store. I love Walmart, and you do too. Don't lie. I was going in the store to buy one thing, just one thing, and I needed help. And I'm going aisle after aisle looking for somebody that I thought might be able to help me. And I finally find somebody that I thought would be able to do this, who worked at the store, and she was on a personal phone call. And I could tell it was personal because I could hear it three aisles over. That's what drew me to her like a moth to the flame. <laughs> and I come up the aisle, and I see her, and she sees me, and I just... Give her the high sign. Like, I'm going to need your help. I need an answer that I think you have. And when I did that little wave, that's how it started, and it went downhill from there. Because she was on the phone, and here's how it went. Shut up. She wasn't even at that party. Oh, my gosh, you are so dumb. No, I, no, gosh. No, I have to go. No, somebody's here. 
No, he's looking at me. <laughs> All right, I'll call you later. <laughs> You're so crazy. Uh, <clears throat> can I help you? And it was just like that. Now, would you feel in that moment you were going to get served well? I sure didn't. I felt the same way we talked about earlier. I felt unimportant. I felt uh, upset. I was irritated. I felt a little worthless in that moment. Uh, that is not the way we want people to take, that's not the emotion we want people to take away when they're with us. So make that commitment. Do everything that you can to make them feel honored. Let's talk about a different experience and talk about my mother-in-law. <laughs> my mother-in-law is a joy to be around. Is she still here? Or did we? <laughs> I'm just kidding. She really is. I looked out in a few departments in my life. This is definitely one of them. Uh, my mother-in-law, quick to laugh, loves to learn, loves working with people. She is a joy to be around. Uh, she just retired a few years ago from being a nurse for 50 years. She dedicated her life to service. The last 15 of it was in oncology, which is a really hard field to be in. Uh, helping people go through the fight of their lives with cancer and their families. Um, so we had her retirement dinner. It was a really nice affair, nice restaurant. We had probably, uh, I think we had about 40 people there that came together and were celebrating all the different milestones of Iris's career in nursing, going all the way back to nursing school at Bellevue in New York City. And it was a really neat night. You know, people were sharing stories and there was a lot of laughter. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm sitting right next to my wife and I'm having a good time too. And all of a sudden the room kind of got hushed. And I looked up from eating, and I was like, what's going on? And I see a guy walking up to the podium. Now, I'll give you the backstory on this guy. This guy was a doctor. And this guy, when he first came to the hospital, had a reputation that preceded him. He was known, first of all, as being brilliant, highly educated, super skilled as a medical doctor. But his people skills were eh. He was known for being caustic, being rude, being dismissive. He would come into a room and look at a chart, make a few comments, and leave just as quickly as he came in and would sometimes not even look the patient in the eye. So this is, this is how he started when he first came to the hospital. And he got partnered up with my mother-in-law. He had no idea what he was in for. She drove him nuts. Because every time he would leave a patient room, my mother-in-law would come up behind him like a ghost and start whispering in his ear, take just a little bit more time, doctor, just a little bit more time. Let them get to know you just a little bit more, get to know their story just a little bit more, just a little bit more time. So that's the background. And I will never forget this because I was sitting next to my wife and I had a fork full of pasta halfway between my plate and my mouth when I heard these words uttered. When I first started working with Iris, I couldn't stand her. <gasps> what? <laughs> That's not how you start these things, man. And he went on, he said, she drove me nuts. She constantly followed me around saying, just a little bit more time, just a little bit more time. He said, I finally started spending an extra 30 seconds with my patients. He said, I thought it was going to kill me. Everybody starts laughing. He said, she finally got me up to an extra minute. He said, I didn't think I could do it. People were still laughing. He said, she finally got me up to an extra two minutes and I couldn't do anymore. And then the laughter kind of died down. He said, those extra two minutes I take with my patients now have completely transformed the way that I practice medicine. I had no idea I could connect or have the connection I have with the people I take care of. This is why I went to medical school. I still get goosebumps when I tell that story. It doesn't need to be four hours of deep look into my eyes time. It can be a small parcel of time, but for crying out loud, folks, make it count. We are put here to serve. It is our highest calling. It is our deepest need. Because in the end, it's what outlives us. It's the legacy we leave behind. How many of your communities, and I bet you money I've been to just about every one of them out there, 
How many of your communities, when you lose an elder, come together and have a feast and have a remembrance of this person that you lost? What gets focused on during that remembrance? You got it. Not where they vacation, not the kind of car they drove or the fancy clothes they wore. They talk about the people's lives, that's lives that they impacted, who they helped, who they served, who they made time for. It's what outlives us in the end. Make it count. We live in a challenging world. We've got to keep first things first. Okay, here's what I want you to do as a group. If we're going to make a change in this dynamic, we're going to move the levers a little bit on the way that we use our time. Again, we have to know where it's going. What I want you to do is, as a group, just have a discussion about where your time goes right now. And as a group, I want you to think about where you could carve 30 minutes of time from your day. Basically meaning, where could you get a combination of 30 minutes where you could be doing less of some other stuff? Where could you grab that time? Where could you carve 30 minutes? So as a group, go ahead and do that. I'll give you about two minutes to do that. Okay. Seems we're getting some good answers already. So if you could carve up to 30 minutes from your day, where would that time come from? Where could it come from? Anybody got an answer? Doing duties that other people are capable of doing? Especially in a leadership position, delegation is critical. If you have a team of 10 people and you're the one doing most of the work, you're doing it wrong. We need to make sure everybody is engaged, everybody is, is adding and contributing to the mission. So we want to make sure that we're doling out that, that work appropriately. Where's another place that you could carve 30 minutes of time? Shannon. Shannon. Schedule shorter meetings. Okay, now here's the thing with meetings. Are meetings important? Yes, because it puts us all in the same sheet. It gives us some face time together. Again, we're building out those strong connections with each other. They're important, but we need to make sure that we're disciplined with the meetings that we have, that they're structured, that they have a timeline that we stick to, that they have an agenda that we stick to, because I think everybody in this room can relate to being in that meeting that never ends. Have you ever had one of those? It's like the meeting that you just wish at some point, you're like, here it goes, here it goes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to wrap up. Oh, no, here we go again. It's like a dance remix that never quits. It's like... <laughs> it never stops. So we need to be disciplined in our means. They are important to have, for sure. But we want to make sure that we keep them contained because they can really get long if we let them. Where's another place that you could carve 30 minutes of time? Email. email. I'm a big believer in chunking up our email, meaning that when you're doing like tasks as a group, we become really efficient, uh, meaning that I break up my day and to check an email at certain times of the day on my schedule. Because if we don't do that, we as people are like hamsters at a food pellet machine. Because all of a sudden, see if this sounds familiar. Ding, what? <laughs> Got to check it. Might be from a cousin. Might be from a friend. Yeah, it might be important. We don't know. We got to check it. If you break up your day and you do email in chunks, we are a lot quicker. We are a lot more efficient with responses. And we're able to get other stuff done between the bing on us to do that. What's another place that you could carve time? Touch things once. T where did that voice come from? <laughs> in, the, in the very back. It sounded like they were right here. <laughs> Touch things once. What does that mean? That means once you get a piece of paperwork, once you get an item, you take care of it, you file it, or you throw it away. Touch it once. It's one of the ways that we can quickly boost our effectiveness and efficiency in what we do. And folks, let, let, hear me on this, please, please. This takes practice. This takes practice. You know, don't, don't go back with these, these tactics and these strategies and then try them one time and it's not working really well and you're struggling with it and say this doesn't work. There are ways that we can improve our effectiveness. 
There are ways that we can get, get rid of the overwhelm that we sometimes allow to creep into our life and our schedule. But we have to practice this stuff. Uh, I know one of the tables mentioned uh, less time in front of the TV. Somebody also said less time with social media. There's a lot of places, and this is what I'm trying to get you to be aware of, that we could take a little piece of time here and there and carve time from our day. Now, why would we want to do that? Because for the next question, now that we just carved 30 minutes extra out of our day, what would you do with that time? Okay, as a table, go ahead and discuss that really quickly. What would you do with an extra 30 minutes each day? All right, and time. Now, first of all, I'm glad that nobody gave the wrong answer that would have made you have to stay after class today when I said, where would you carve 30 minutes of time? And the wrong answer is when somebody said, sleep less. That's the wrong answer. And I'm glad nobody said it because you would have been in trouble. The, the other one that I have over the years learned that if this gets brought up, I need to address this. When people say, I would drive to work faster. Okay, that, that is not a solution, folks. Please do not do that. Don't walk out of here saying, he told me to do it. That's not a solution. So you came up with some good places to carve 30 minutes of time because we have to know at the end of the day, there, there are certain things that we have to do and there are certain things that we can do. That's how we move the levers just a little bit and adjust. So where would you put that extra 30 minutes? Who's got an answer in the far back? Self-care, absolutely, lutely. And we're gonna come back to that. Who's got another one? Somebody said exercise, which is in that realm of self-care. We'll come back to that. Who, where else would you put 30 minutes of time? Connect with people. Person-to-person connect -person connections. Because like I said, those investments, those small investments of time will count towards that overall relationship. Would you agree? I'll give you a quick uh, trivia question. Why do squirrels collect nuts? <laughs> you guys are like, if you weren't paying attention, that just totally threw you for a loop right there. <laughs> Did he just say squirrels and nuts? Yes. Why do squirrels collect nuts? They're preparing for the winter, and the winter is tough. It's hard to find food. They know winter is coming. Game of Thrones. So they collect them for that reason. The other reason why they collect so many is because, according to the University of Richmond, they lose up to 75% of the nuts they collect. Due to two reasons, and this is kind of sad. Number one, theft <laughs> from other squirrels and birds. If you ever see a bird on a branch watching a squirrel dig a hole, the, the bird's over there going, oh, yeah, I know right where that one is. <laughs> and the other reason why is the squirrels forget where they put the nuts. <laughs> so it doesn't just happen to us. So they, hoard, they put away more than they need. And the point I'm trying to make with that is in our relationships, we do the same thing. Uh, with your colleagues, with the people you serve in the community, Every time we have one of those positive interactions, one of those positive investments of time, it's like we're collecting a nut for the future. Uh, based on that goodwill, that connection, that familiarity, that really builds strong bonds and relationships. Uh, because at the end of the day, a lot of them won't be remembered. We gotta be honest about that. Uh, so we wanna put away as many as we can. That's what strengthens that relationship. And here's a really cool part about nature teaching us again, which our elders have always believed in. They still teach it today. Nature teaches us about everything. Um, you know the way that a squirrel checks a nut quality? They lift it up and see if it's got weight. They shake it. And if it's heavy, that's a good one. And if it's hollow, that means it's rotted and it's a dud. And again, it's the same with those positive interactions. If you actually have a genuine moment with somebody where you're given that time and you're present and you're willing, that's a good give. But if you're doing something cheap and saying, hey, how are you doing today? And then you leave the room before they have a chance to answer, that's kinda, it kind of rings hollow. So we need to make sure we're collecting those right type of positive interactions. Uh, it really strengthens those relationships. Uh, where else would you put that time? Reading the Bible. Doing something that strengthens you, right? What's another one in the back? Prioritizing and scheduling. Prioritizing and scheduling. Again, 
Measure twice, cut once. It's a lot more efficient and effective when we do it that way. Because if we don't have a game plan, all of a sudden we're doing what we probably shouldn't do on a daily basis, which is just winging it. Uh, I don't think we're around long enough to just wing it. If we want to get results, we need to do that with clarity. Planning really helps. And give me one more. What other place would you want to put that extra time? Family. Uh, being able to, to take time to be with the people that give us strength, uh, that, that give us love, and that we're able to give love in return. Now, I'm asking these questions because, like I said, it's important that we know what this looks like. Who here has seen the movie Dances with Wolves? Now, I know that's not as many hands as I expected to see. Let's talk about that movie for a second. There is a scene, because only I, out of the hands I got, about 14 of you in this room have seen Dances with Wolves, according to what I just saw. If you saw that movie, there is a scene where Kevin Costner, who is a member of the U.S. Army, is hunting buffalo with the tribe that he's staying with, and they're out on the prairie, and they're hauling the mail on the horses, and they're hunting buffalo. And he's going so fast that he loses his hat. And he keeps going, and later that night at camp, they're sitting around the fire, they're telling stories about the buffalo hunt, and all of a sudden, he realizes somebody else has his hat on. And he says, hey man, you've got my hat. And the other guy's like, uh-uh, you didn't want it. And it almost becomes a conflict. And a third party had to get involved, and he said, hey, if you want to keep the hat, that's fine, but you have to give him something in exchange. And what did he give the person? What did he give Kevin Costner in exchange for his hat? See, you've seen the movie, his knife. Everybody's whispering it, his knife, his knife. I don't want to say that I saw it, but it's his knife. So he gives him his knife, and then the guy says, what, what does he say? Wash day, right? Which means good or good trade. You're happy, you're happy, good. That same exact dynamic is happening every day of our lives. We are trading our time for something. We're either making good trades by putting it into our relationships, our self-care, our knowledge, uh, improving our knowledge base, or we're putting it into bad trades uh, where, where we're putting way too much time into media or social media. We're putting way too much time into gossip or rumor or talking about the weekend or what's going on next weekend or whatever it may be. We're, we're constantly trading that time for something. So we have to be aware of it. And I'm not saying don't do stuff that's entertaining. I'm not saying that don't do stuff that makes you feel good or, or, or uh, get you to have the personal time with the people in your life. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm asking you to do is be more aware of how much is going into those things. Because at the end of the day, if you want real clarity on your time and where it goes, ask yourselves two questions. Number one, am I putting enough time into the things that matter? And number two, am I maybe putting too much time into the things that don't? Only we can answer that question. But it's the most important resource we have. Make no mistake about it. The right answer for where we want to put that time goes back to self-care. It's related, and it's this next resource that we all have access to on a daily basis. You have it. I have it. We don't have to do super or get supervisor, supervisor approval to use it. We don't have to fill out anything in triplicate, and it's a resource that I don't want to call anybody out by name, but some of you are running low in this right now. What is that resource? She said it, and you guys are running so low in this, you couldn't even say the word. Because some of you actually had the right answer and you started and couldn't even finish. You're like, energy. <laughs> Holy cow. That's our second one. Energy. Is energy limited? Can you do it all today? Can you do it all this week? Can you do it all this month? Usually when I get to a month, this is where people go, Maybe. I think I got this. Listen, folks, we can't do everything this planet has to offer in a lifetime. That is an impossibility. And we set ourselves up for overwhelm when we think differently. Energy is limited. But 
it is renewable. It is rechargeable. That's the good news. But it's a limited resource that we have to honor and use well. Uh, if it's a, it's a limited resource, but yet we set ourselves up for overwhelm when we do stuff. Like, and it starts off as just kind of a thought in our head, and then we actually breathe life into it with our words. When we say crazy stuff like, I've got a million things to do today. You ever have one of those? I have got a million things to do today. If you've ever had a million things to do today kind of day, how many things do you get done at the end of the day? Be honest. Okay, the range I just heard was from two to zero. <laughs> that is not a big range. And usually whatever we do, it's not at a high level of quality anyways. How could it be if we're going a million different directions? We're doing the worst thing a warrior can do in battle. We're dividing and conquering ourselves before the fight even starts. And we feel it too, don't we? I mean, everybody in this room has dedicated your life to serving somebody else, correct? Else you wouldn't be here. And we all want to have an impact. We want to make a difference. A terrible recipe is created when we put it in ourselves in a place of overwhelm because we create a recipe that we, none of us want uh, to be served, especially in a service environment, where we feel ineffective. We don't want to create that. That's what happens when we say stuff like, I got a million things to do today, and we have one of those kind of days. We're scattered, and we feel it. We feel it at our core. It's limited, but it's rebootable. How? What's the best way to do this? The free way to do this? Sleep. Right answer. And I know some of you are in desperate need of that because you were partying way too much last night. Okay, sleep. This is the free way, the healthy way, one of the kindest, healthiest things you can do for yourself as a human being. And the studies are showing this now. This is no longer anecdotal. They're doing big studies now on sleep and sleep deprivation. And it is on the radar now for not only medical practitioners, but uh, anybody who's serious about making an impact in somebody else's life. Our starting, there's books coming out. There, there was a quote on the front of National Geographic uh, that came out earlier this year, or maybe end of last year. And I'm going to paraphrase this. It was from a doctor at Harvard who basically said, we are now living a real-life experiment in our nation of sleep deprivation. So it's on the radar now. And it's no longer anecdotal. It's, it's not a joking matter anymore when people come in and go, oh, I'm grumpy. You know, I didn't get enough sleep again last night for the 563rd night in a row we got to take this stuff seriously. This is one of the best ways to add impact to our service model, too. How many hours are we supposed to get each night to be at our best, according to doctors and scientists? Seven to eight on average is what we require to be at our best, on average. I had a guy a few months ago said 13. <laughs> I stopped the program. And I said, sir, are you a cat or a toddler? Let's be honest, 13 would be nice, but at the end of the day, seven to eight on average is what we need to be at our best. Uh, but yet, how many do we get each night? I'm not hearing seven to eight. I'm hearing something less and sometimes a lot less than that, and yet we wonder why we feel the way that we feel. We wonder why we feel, uh, well, why we struggle to solve even small problems, to stay focused. Uh, why we get headaches, why we have trouble staying awake at work, why we say some, sometimes say something in a moment we regret for a week, why we can't remember things. Anybody here have CRS? Can't remember stuff? <laughs> and they're finding it, it has as much to do, it, we always blame it on age, but it has a lot to do with how much sleep we're getting, how much stress we're putting ourselves under because we're not getting enough reboot time to let our bodies and brains do what they do after a good night of sleep, and yet we're expecting the same level of performance the next day without it. You know, I'm gonna take a big leap of faith. Everybody in this room wants to give 100% of who you are and what you could do on a daily basis. How realistic is that when you go in with a half charge or less battery? Folks, that's like planting carrot seeds and hoping coconuts grow. 
that is a complete disconnect from reality. And in those moments, we struggle because we are out of alignment. We're not putting ourselves into a position to serve well because we're robbing ourselves of that reboot time that we all need. You know, when people say stuff, and they, sometimes it's even in a, in a, a braggy way, oh, I don't need seven, eight hours. I, I get by just fine on four. I, I beg to differ because they're showing that, that long-term sleep deprivation has some huge health impacts that none of, nobody wants to entertain in their life. Uh, the most common dynamic for not getting the right amount of sleep, and, and I already know what you're thinking, because this is why when I started working with the planning committee and I was having conversations with Shani, or, uh, Shannon and Jenny, they wanted to bring me back because they know I'm psychic. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. Seven to eight hours a night, man, are you nuts? How on earth am I ever going to find a, to do that? Which is the most common excuse we use to neglect and abuse ourselves. And I'm going to tell you two things that everybody here needs to hear. Two, two realities. Number one, there is no time for anything in this life. There is no pre-designated time to work, to eat, to pray, to play with our families, or spend time with loved ones, or to sleep. There is only time for what we make time for. And if your health and wellness are not at the top of that pyramid, I will tell you what you've also probably experienced. Everything that you're trying to do may fall short because of what we just said before. How can you possibly deliver 100% when we're going in with a half-charged battery? It's unrealistic, folks. We set ourselves up for overwhelm when we do that. That's number one. Number two, there will always be something else on TV. There will always be another Netflix episode of that show you just have to catch up on. There will always be another dumb video of a cat, dog, or a monkey doing something stupid on YouTube that your friend sent you last night. And all those things take little bits of time away from that precious recharge time that we need to be at our best the next day. Get back in alignment. Uh, I come from a military background, and I'm an avid reader of history. And I will tell you that throughout the millennia, the number one way to torture another human being and extract information from them that they don't want to give up is to do what? Deprive them of sleep. Why? Because it works. How often does it work? Every time it's used. Because if you deny somebody sleep consistently and for long enough, it breaks us down physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually until we have nothing left to fight with. And sometimes we're doing that to ourselves. We got to get out of that type of activity and get back into alignment. Carve that time out. You know, I wish just like you do for nap time to come back. Man, when I was a kid, I couldn't stand nap time. I hated that. I thought it was the biggest waste of time. I would throw myself on the ground and wiggle around like a worm on a skillet. I couldn't stand nap time. But how many times do you have conversations with other professionals that would give their right arm to have nap time come back? How awesome would that be? 11.30 rolls around, you get issued your chocolate milk, your sleeping mat, and you're like, where are we doing this? <laughs> that would be awesome. We might not ever get back to that place, but it doesn't mean we can't carve that time out for ourselves. We need it. When we get a good night's sleep, we cleanse our blood, we clean out our brains, our neurons actually shrink in size, and cerebral spinal fluid washes through and clears out debris, which might prevent the onset of dementia or even Alzheimer's. I mean, the studies that they're coming up with now on the benefits of sleep are mind-boggling. Um, and we've gotten away from it because we've always needed this throughout our, our history, and for some reason, just recently, we think we can get away without it, and we can't. Our elders uh, have always said, and they still say this today, the outdoors are our greatest classroom. Nature would teach us everything we needed to be a successful, happy, healthy human being. And the Max Planck Institute in Germany took our elders to task, and they studied animals and their sleep patterns. And here's what they found out in the essence of time. Here's what they found out. The animals that got enough sleep had six 
times the immunity cells in their bloodstreams. Six times. These suckers were bulletproof. They were resiliency in action. The ones that didn't get enough sleep had 24 times the parasites. Ugh. Now, what does that mean for us? If you're a professional in service to other people in 2019 and beyond, you go into work, you don't have enough sleep, are you going to get a tapeworm? I don't know who you hang with. It's possible. It's not likely. But it doesn't mean that you're not dealing with parasites. We deal with those every day. A parasite, by definition, is something that latches onto a living creature and slowly sucks the life out of them. We deal with that dynamic every day. They just don't come in the form of a hookworm or a tick. What form do they come in? And don't name names. This is the dangerous part of the program. I actually had this happen. This was terrible. It was a big group. It was a group about this size. I said, you know, what else can be parasitic? And somebody, somebody in the group yells, Larry. Now, I hope we don't have any Larrys here. If we do, I don't mean to offend you, but that was the, wor that was the name that was shouted out. That's bad. But what was worse is the 10 people around that person who gave the answer all agreed. They're like, oh, yeah, he's just like that. He sure is. That's bad. But let's be honest. It can be people. It can be people. It can be negative interactions. Uh, some people, I mean, let's be honest, folks. Not everybody in this world is easy to get along with. Sometimes we're in that category, too. Let's be honest. But it doesn't mean that, you know, there, there are certain people that you're going to have to learn how to navigate and work with regardless. Doesn't mean that you need to go have coffee with them and share all your hopes and dreams and, and go on weekends away together, but it does mean you have to learn how to be able to create a relationship where you're able to exchange information ideas for the betterment of the community that you serve. That's called being a professional. We, they don't have to be our best friend. They don't have to be our pen pals or our blood brother or sister, but we do need to be able to work with them. Because when we don't do that and we allow pride and ego to get in the way, and I've seen this happen, I know you have too in your home communities, where you got two groups of people that should be working together and they don't. You ever have that? I'm always blown away by that. I go into a tribal community and I go, wait, wait a minute, you're supposed to be working with them. They've got answers you need and you've got answers they need. How come you're not working together? And you hear one of them, you know, will we'll speak up and go, well, we don't work with them anymore because uh, we've got history. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what history is that? He goes, well, I don't actually know the history, <laughs> but we've got history. And then you start doing some research, and you find it's over a budget dispute from like 1997. Who suffers for that? Team A, Team B, not nearly as much as who they're committed to serving. That's who suffers for it in the end. You know, we, we have to learn to navigate this stuff. But, but it can be people. It can be negative interactions. What else can be parasitic on a daily basis? I know that when we don't plan well and we don't organize well, all of a sudden everything gets dumped on us and piled up and everything has the same level of urgency, which boosts our what? Anxiety. That can definitely be parasitic and draining. What else can be parasitic? Fear definitely can be draining. And the one that I'm looking for that's closely related to fear is a condition we're all under every day, which is what? Stress, which can drain us, if, we're, if unaddressed, can drain us until we're dried little corn husks of who we used to be. The good news is, with a good night of sleep, we deal with all those things so much better. We are more patient, we are more kind, we are more likely to find solutions to our problems. We are more likely to, to work together well in a team environment. All based on something, folks, that is free. You don't have to get supervisor approval for it. It's a choice that we make, and we've got to carve that time out and stick our flag in the ground. It will never be convenient. Like I said, there will always be something else on TV, and there's no pre-designated time for it. We have to make time for it. 
Okay, here's what I want you to do as a group. Group discussion on a dynamic or a word that we talk about all the time in society anymore, and it's multitasking. So what I want you to do as a group is I want you to come up with, and we're not going to, I'm not going to define what it is right now. We, I think we all know just that we've heard it enough, or we have some guesses, but we're going to unpack that word in just a minute. But what I want you to do is come up with four benefits, four pros for multitasking, and four cons, four negatives for multitasking, why we wouldn't want to do it, okay? So four pros, four cons. We're keeping it simple. We're keeping it foundational here. So do that. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. All right. And I was just explaining to this group here, the reason why we're doing this, we're making, because <laughs> she, she was joking with me. She said, this isn't a trick question, is it? Yeah, I, you guys are so suspicious of all the questions. No, I'm trying to keep this simple because a lot of this comes down to, at the end, awareness. You know, notice I'm not talking about anything to do with intention. I know the intention is pure. I know what led you to this career field because I've worked shoulder to shoulder with you for 25 years now. The intention is pure and it's, in a, and it's good. But what gets messed up is the execution. The way that we plan, the way that we outlay our resources or utilize our resources, that's what gets messed up and leads us to overwhelm to where we're in a position where we don't want to be when we're in service to others, which is feeling ineffective. We don't want to do that. So a lot of this is just taking the blinders off and, and being aware. So what did you come up with? Um, four reasons uh, why we would want to multitask or four benefits and then four negatives, four reasons why we might not want to. And then we're going to explain the word and what I, because we need to be clear on that too. But right now, just based on gut level, how you feel and what you think about it, what's a benefit to multitasking? Okay, I heard it from both sides. I got it in stereo. We get more done. That's sometimes what we think about with multitasking. We get more done. What's another positive for multitasking? We feel energized. Yeah, of course, because we're putting ourselves in a mode where we're like, we're, you know, every, everything gets, everything rises, adrenaline gets pumped up, right? We'll come back to that one too. What's another benefit? If you have a working system in place. If you have a working system in place, well, yeah, we want a working system in place. And is that part of what you would think of as multitasking, is having a plan or having a working system? Okay. And who's got one from in the back? One more benefit of multitasking. You feel empowered? Because you get all this stuff done. You have a feeling of accomplishment. Okay. Now, let's go with some of the reasons why we might not want to multitask. Can't get anything done, I just heard. What's another one? Danger of not giving 100%, and I'm still trying to hear hers. Can't do two things at one time. You feel overwhelmed. <laughs> it looks like, did you just hear that? Looks like you do too much and then you get more work. <laughs> My gosh, Jenny. It, what was, hold on just a sec. There you go. That was a good observation. I like that. He said, t tending to lose sight of his threshold, like where you're at your best, and then we easily go over that, uh, which, which is a common thing. Because what happens is stress can serve us. It can. We can be at peak stress where we're at peak performance, and that feels great. It's where stress is actually helping us, and we're getting stuff done, and things are working out, and we're feeling really good, and it feels so good, we're like, well, let's put more on the plate. I could do more stuff. And then we get into the other side of the stress curve, and that's called distress. That's where stress starts to have some wonky effects on us, where it affects our performance, it affects our health, our relationships, and, and it doesn't serve the people that we have signed up to serve. Uh, so that great observation there. So let's talk about multitasking. Let's unpack that word really quickly. Multitasking, uh, I, I've read a couple books on multitasking, and I've read many articles on multitasking, and I stopped reading them because what what, they all came back with the same conclusion. Multitasking is doing many things at one time poorly. That was the conclusion in every one of them. 
Because, and, and let me be clear about this, folks. This doesn't mean that we're not getting a lot done in the course of a day. We should be able to do that. What I'm talking about is the way that we do it. Because when we're multitasking, we're trying to do everything at one time. And scientists, behavioral scientists, don't even call it multitasking. They call it rapid switching. What rapid switching is, is we are going in between activities so quickly that it gives the appearance that we are doing many things at one time. <laughs> but we're not. What we're, but, and what they also found with multitasking is we are um, much more likely to make mistakes. We are much more likely not to get work done at all. We are also much more likely to jack our anxiety and stress up through the ceiling. Uh, there is a lot of negatives to trying to approach our work that way. And I know that we're pressured, we put the pressure on ourselves sometimes too. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't get a lot done in the course of a day, but we have to remember our brains, the way that we're built, it's based on biology more than anything. Um, but before I explain to you what that means, I wanna go back to the, to the movie that I recommend everybody see if you haven't already. The movie Up. Have you seen that movie? If you haven't seen that movie, that is your homework assignment in the next couple of weeks to watch the Pixar movie Up because it's a great movie. Even though it's animated, they deal with some deep life issues like um, getting older, uh, losing loved ones along the way. And it's one of the only movies that can consistently make me cry. And my daughters love that. That movie will come on and they'll conspire together and one will talk to the other and go, hey, up is on. Go get dad. <laughs> Every time. And they'll bring me in the room. They're like, dad, look what's on. And I go, oh, no. Well, let me just watch this one part. And then I do and I start the waterworks. If you've not seen the movie Up, there's a character in that movie and he's this lovable goofball golden retriever named Doug. And if you ever wanted to hear the inner workings and thoughts of a dog, you need to watch the movie Up. Because through the power of technology, they developed a collar that is a box that goes on Doug's neck and translates his doggy sounds into human language. And poor Doug. He comes running up to people, his tail's wagging, his hungs, or tongue's hanging out, and he comes up, he goes, hi, would you like to play with squirrel?" I'm looking for my master. Have you seen him? Squirrel. <laughs> and every time I see that scene, I crack up because I say, that is us. <laughs> Think about how familiar this is. We're at work, and we start a task. And we're working on it, and we're creating momentum, and we're getting close to the finish line, and all of a sudden, <gasps> squirrel. We open up a new task, and we're working on it, and we're creating momentum, we're getting close to the finish line, and all of a sudden, squirrel. And we open another one. Next thing you know, we've got five tasks open. Does this sound familiar? And on the fifth task, we're working it, we're, we're creating momentum, and all of a sudden, <gasps> squirrel. We go back to the first one. Now, before we, we resume work on that first one, we have to do some mental gymnastics that burn up time and energy. What do we have to do before we start work again? Number one, remember where we were, right? And number two, we have to put all those other tasks on a mental shelf, both of which require time, energy, and effort. Uh, it's a really inefficient way to get things done. And, and again, I'll go back to the way that the human brain is built. It's based on biology. We all know what parallel processing is, right? We, our computers do that really well. That means our computers, when they parallel process, they can work multiple problems at one time quickly and accurately. We don't work like that as people. We don't work on all four tasks at once effectively. We work on one task at a time effectively. That's called working in serial. That's doing one task to completion to the best of our ability. I know interruptions come up, I get it. But to the best of our ability that we can work on one task until completion before moving on, our efficiency starts to rise. And again, folks, this is something we have to practice. I implore you to practice it. Not, this is not a one-off. This is not just, okay, DJ, got it. I'm going to do it like that forever. This takes practice because we live in a busy, hurry-up world where there's a lot expected of us. But that, that discipline will start to come in where the more efficient you are on working on one thing at a time, uh, the better results you get at the end of the day. And that's really what we're trying to create here.
The last, the last little idea. When we're able to harness our energy towards the right things, we get the right results. If we let that energy deplete and try to do everything, we end up getting nothing done. If you stand out in the parking lot of this hotel, and I don't know if the sun came out or not, it was kind of rainy earlier, but if the sun popped out and you're standing out in the parking lot of this hotel for five minutes out in the sunshine, what is going to happen to you as a human being? And this is not a trick question again. <laughs> guy's like, I, I haven't been out there. What's he talking about? What's out, what's, out, what's out in the parking lot? Shannon said it. You feel revitalized. We, we relax. Uh, we maybe get a little mental reboot. Uh, but there's nothing dramatic going to happen to us in five minutes of standing in the sunshine. Even though there is a star only 93 million miles away from the planet pumping an insane amount of energy at this place, it's spread out. So it doesn't have a significant effect in any one particular place. However, if you take that sun that's falling gently on your face and you harness it into, say, a magnifying glass, any 10-year-old kid will tell you what you can do with that. This ex-10-year-old kid used to do it all the time. And I got busted for it. You can light your backyard on fire. And it's all through the power of focus. Focus your energy on the right stuff, you'll get the right results. But you let your energy deplete into every direction, and at the end of the day, we've got nothing to show for it. We have to make these choices on a daily basis. Third resource, and we'll go, go through this one quickly. I know lunch is coming up around the corner, um, but this one we would be d definitely in a bad position if we didn't address this one. All, everybody in this room, I want you to visualize this from now until forever. That everybody in this room has a toolkit at your side. And this toolkit is filled with all the stuff that makes you uniquely and powerfully you in a service environment. All the stuff that you have collected, all the stuff that you have learned, all the things that you've developed as habits and practices in your life that allow you to serve other people well, all of that is in that toolkit. The servers are never down. You have access to it 24-7, and I promise you, you've got more in that toolkit than you need in 100 careers. But what happens is we run into the smallest speed bump, setback, challenge, criticism, doubt, hesitation, something doesn't go right, something goes sideways, small bump in the road, and instead of looking at the toolkit on what we have to work with, we get that freaked out deer in headlights look. <laughs> deer don't do that. <laughs> I think I'm watching too many Walking Dead commercials. If you see a deer do this, <gasps> you should go away. Because that deer's messed up. But what do deer do? You know, your home communities. Deer go, and poof, get run over. And that can happen to us. Look at your toolkit. I bet you money, whatever you're going through right now, you've been through something just as bad or worse, and you're still here doing your thing. Dig into your toolkit and use what you've got. Use what you've collected. So what I want you to do really quickly, last little group exercise, I want you to talk about some of the tools that you have in your toolkit and maybe some of the other ones that are in your neighbor's toolkit at your table. But I want you to unpack this because it is infinitely important to know what we bring to the table each day in the work that we do, what we contribute to the success of the team. Because if we are not aware of it, how on earth can we use it, folks? And we are really good at focusing on what we lack. Would you agree with that? what we don't have, what we didn't get, the certificate we didn't earn, the experience we didn't have an opportunity to pursue. We are sometimes really bad at focusing on what we do bring. Our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our education, our experience, our wisdom, all that good stuff that makes you uniquely and powerfully you. So I want you to unpack that, take the blinders off, look in your toolkit. Really quickly, last couple minutes of the group, uh, talk about what some of those things may be. I want you to list at least 10. Go fast. Who's got, uh, who's got one or two they want to share at your group? What'd you come up with? Experience. Experience. 
Is that a good tool to have in your toolkit? Absolutely, positively, yes. You can buy a lot of stuff on Amazon.com, but you can't buy that. We have to earn it. And when, especially when you combine that experience in a team environment, again, force multiplying. You start adding up the combined amount of years you have in your groups uh, doing the childcare work that you guys have, you're gonna be blown away by what you come up with. What's another resource that you have in your toolkit? Knowledge. Knowledge. Is this one important to do what we do? Of course, and we, we need to keep adding to it. You know, that's one of the things that I said earlier, school's never out for us. We need to constantly be adding to our toolkit. Uh, the conferences like this, the get together, the face to face are wonderful for that. Because some of the best conversations don't even happen in the rooms, they happen in the hallways, they happen at the restaurants where people are comparing notes and saying, hey, we're struggling with this at our home site, what are you doing to remedy this? And you start comparing notes and we go away with some priceless knowledge and information. Uh, what's another resource that you have? Eagerness to learn. Can anybody make us eager to learn? Nope, that's a personal choice. And the people who are eager to learn, uh, they're the ones who build a go-to reputation in a community because that comes out in everything they do. It comes out in their words, their behavior. People can, can feel that. Uh, emanating from somebody when they're eager to do the work, when they're eager to learn, eager to help. What's another resource you have in your toolkit? Work ethic. Another one, beautiful. What else? The contacts, the people you know, our network. Is that a valuable resource? Absolutely. We were having this conversation earlier. We don't need to know all the answers, but when we have a good network, you have people that you can seek advice from and, and get answers from. You know, the network I've built over the years, I, you know, you lean on that during times. It, it gives you a great amount of confidence and courage uh, in the work that we do. To know that you have a list of people that you can call at any given moment, any given day, to get resources, to get answers, to get support, encouragement, whatever it may be. And if you don't have that built, start working on it. Our networks are key. We are social creatures by design, folks. We are a lot more, and I was taught this traditionally, we are a lot more like ants and bees than we are like eagles. We need each other, and we're better when we're in a group because we get to share those resources. What's one, one more resource in your toolkit? One more thing you bring to the table? Empathy. Is it important to be empathetic in the work you do? Absolutely. To be able to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, even if it's for a few seconds, to understand where they're coming from, what they're going through. And what was another one? Compassion. Compassion. Another critical element in especially working in service of other people. Uh, the reason why I'm asking you this and pushing you for answers is because it's important we identify it. Because I have conversations with folks all the time that are not seeing the contribution that they're bringing into work every day. They're not looking at those tools and those superpowers, I look at them as, that we bring in. Uh, and I talk to people sometimes that at, at the end of the sessions, they'll come up and they'll say, well, I got this challenge, and this is what's going on, and then this, and this, and you can almost kind of watch it unravel. And you can see the stress that they're under and the strain. And usually about that point in the conversation, I, I, I hit the pause button and say, hold, hold on just a sec. Let me ask you a question. Do you have power? Do you have talent? Do you have ability? And you can see the wheels start turning kind of slowly at first, and then people go, eh, yeah, I guess. That's not the level I'm looking for here. You know, just to appreciate something, to look at it from a distance is one thing, um, and go, yeah, that has value. But when you understand something, it drives our decisions. It drives our behavior. It gets us excited. It gets us motivated. Uh, to do the work that we do. There's a big difference between those things, appreciating and understanding. Um, I learned this difference firsthand when our first daughter, Gabby, was born. Um, I've been married for 20 years to a wonderful woman. She is my rock, my left hand, my right hand. Uh, and we've got two great daughters, an 18-year-old and a 13-year-old. Our 18-year-old is a black belt in Taekwondo. We're trying to get her ready for dating and <laughs> 10 years, so we're trying to square her away. And our little one teaches me every day about resilience, uh, the power of humor, and being tough in a tough world. She's, uh, she was born with mild cerebral palsy, so she's been special needs, been in braces all her life, uh, physical therapy. Um, 
but she's taught me more about this life than I've ever taught her. And I tell you, when these two were born, my wife made a decision for our family. She decided she would breastfeed. Now, anybody who's been through that experience or knows somebody who's been through that experience, you know that is a sacrifice that you make out of love, a sacrifice of time, of energy, and especially comfort. And I watched my wife go through this the first week, and every day I thanked the creator that I was a man. <laughs> because my wife would go through the same routine. She would hold Gabby in front of her, get ready to feed her, and And I'm watching this as a man from the back corner of the room and going, <gasps> <clears throat> look like it hurt. And don't get me wrong, I respected what my wife was doing. I appreciated what she was doing. But I did not understand what she was doing. And until one fateful morning, everything changed. She's getting ready for the day. She's taking a shower. I'm laying in bed with Gabby. She's on my chest. I'm singing her a little song. Shirt's off. Everything is going great. And the only way that it could have gotten better for her is if breakfast was thrown in the mix. And she, in one fluid motion, rotated her head over and in one attempt, latched on. And she was on. Now, when I regained consciousness, it might have been five, it might have been six minutes later, I don't remember that, but I remember waking up screaming. I remember going, oh God, why, why? I had to reach down with my thumb to wedge her gums off of my chest. I didn't know something so little could bite so hard. And I reached down with my thumb and wedged it open, and if you've ever heard a brand new pickle jar that you just brought home, that first twist that you hear the sound. That was exactly what I heard. I looked down at this bruised, crumpled, deformed mess that used to be the left side of my chest as a tear slowly rolled out of my eye. My wife hears all this commotion, comes running in the bedroom and sees this terrible scene laid out in front of her. There's Gabby on her back kicking and screaming and crying her little eyes out. And right next to her is me kicking and screaming and crying my little eyes out. But I tell you what, my whole perspective changed. No longer did I just appreciate what she was doing, I understood it just a little bit more and it made all the difference for me. Because I will tell you, before that happened, I have never felt so useless as a man. Because I would walk into the room and I'd see this beautiful bonding moment going on between mother and child that I wasn't part of. And I'd stand there in the room and, do you want me to, Turn on the TV or <laughs> felt useless. After that, I was a changed man. I would, she would get ready to feed Gabby. I would run in with bells on. I would stand there and go, what do you want? You want me to bake a cake, paint the house? What do you need? <laughs> I was ready. So sometimes we go through a moment in time in our careers where we have a setback. We, get, we, we have something go sideways. We get challenged uh, where we really start to realize what tools we bring to the table. Not just appreciating it, but really understanding it. And I encourage you to do that. This is a lifetime exploration, folks. Uh, we never just sit back and go, yep, I've got that great stuff, good. We need to keep growing it. Uh, some of the ones that got brought up, education, experience, training, uh, attitude, hands down, is one of the most important tools we have in our toolkit when working with other human beings. Uh, I don't think we give attitude the street cred that it deserves, especially in a service environment. Uh, we, we say, we talk a good game about attitude, but we sometimes don't understand how impactful this can really be. Uh, attitude, have you ever seen somebody get hired or fired based on attitude? We see that all the time. Isn't that the number one reason people get fired? And it's not just that they're coming to work with a frown on their face or they're kind of grumpy. That's just the beginnings. Because when we talk about the attitude going out of control and getting somebody released, it's like having a pot on a stove that starts to boil over. What else starts to be affected with somebody's attitude? The people around them, their relationships. What else gets affected? Their work performance. Um, and, and all of a sudden, it comes to a moment where they get let go. Have you ever seen attitude make a relationship stronger or break it apart? We see that all the time. 
You know, have, and now here's the deeper thought. Have you ever seen attitude make a good situation go bad because of somebody's nasty attitude? But on the flip side of that, and don't lose sight of this, have you ever seen a bad situation become better because somebody was leading by example and showed a better attitude in that moment? Attitude is a game changer, folks. Uh, it's infectious. It's definitely one of those things that's worth spreading. <clears throat> and I've got great news. I just saved a bunch of money on my car insurance. <laughs> the great news is it's our choice. It's our choice that we make before we ever get to work in the morning on what attitude we want to bring in. But like I said, if we are leaders by example, we are transmitters. We are constantly transmitting information. And what we transmit out, more often than not, is what we get back. So start with that, that attitude. It's, a, it's critically important in a service environment. Um, and the last thing I, I want you to remember about the skill set, <clears throat> it's not even what you have in there that matters. And everybody's got great tools, uh, whether it's your work ethic, your attitude, your personal experience. Uh, you can keep going down the laundry list. What matters is how you use this great stuff on a daily basis. It's not about the tools that you have, it's how you use them. For crying out loud, how many basic colors are there in the primary color wheel? Quick. Eight. Not eight, who said eight? You went to a fancy school. <laughs> Three. Three primary colors, not 57, not 119. And with those three basic colors, there are artists in your home communities that are creating beautiful pieces of artwork with three basic colors. It's not how many they have, it's how they use what they have. How many basic notes in the musical scales? Any musicians here? How many basic notes? Seven. It's a handful. And with those seven basic notes, there are traditional pieces of music in our native communities that have endured for over a thousand years. It's not how many notes you have, it's how you use them. How many letters in the English alphabet? If you don't know, don't guess. <laughs> With those 26 letters, pieces have been written that have moved millions of people to action. It's not what you have, it's how you use what you have every day. I'm passionate about this idea in particular uh, because I see it everywhere I go. I have traveled throughout Indian country in the last 25 years of my life, and I have seen small teams over and over and over again, small teams with next to nothing in resources, like that little image that I gave you earlier. This is about the resources they have to work with, and they're making magic happen for their people. Because what they don't have out here, they're making up for in here and up here. They're putting their good stuff together and making wonderful things happen for the people they have committed to serving. So I'm passionate about that, and I get reminders about that every time I travel. The other reason why I'm passionate about this is I'm living, walking proof of this concept in action. My home community and my, my family back home have a lot of the same stuff we see too much of in our home communities. My family, we had broken homes. We had divorces, we had unemployment, we had drug and alcohol addiction, we had suicides, incarcerations, you name it, my family had it. My parents were teenagers in poverty when they had me. Didn't have two nickels to rub together, everything they owned could fit in the trunk of a car, and they did not own a car. They didn't have any of the stuff I take for granted in my life uh, today. No carpet, no curtains, no TV, no radio. They would make one meal and eat it all week. They read to each other at night for entertainment. They didn't have money for a TV or a radio, but they had money to go buy a used book at Goodwill and read to each other at night. And I benefited from that tremendously. The first book that was writ read out loud to me was Mario Puzo's The Godfather. <laughs> you can't write this stuff, folks. <laughs> and I'm not recommending that for your child care programs either. Don't take that out of the room. <clears throat> The first three months of my life, I slept in a dresser drawer. It, it was open. <laughs> At least that's what I was told. But it made, it made it surreal to come from that kind of a background and use the resources I had, be them ever so humble, to many years later show up to Washington, D.C., where I was slated to be a keynote speaker. I'm being checked off by the head of security who's got a submachine gun over his shoulder, looks down at the list, finds my name on it, thankfully, and says, 
Welcome to the White House, Mr. Vanis. I can't put that moment into words. The point I try to make with that story is simply this. It doesn't matter where you come from. And it doesn't matter what you have. What matters is how you honor where you come from and how you use what you have on a daily basis. That's what creates impact. Not wishing for it, not hoping for it, not walking around long enough for something to fall out of the sky, but creating it on purpose, with purpose, by design. That's how we create victory in what we do. And the ideas that we're unpacking today, they're all about getting back to a place of clarity and operating from a position of strength. We live in a chaotic, tough world. I get it. There are challenges abound. But you are in a new era of child care. You have some great resources on the pathway ahead of you. And how you leverage and use those are going to define how your child care program looks five years from now. The work that you do, the way that you organize, the way that you plan, and the way that you attack that plan. And using our personal resources, those basic things we talked about, how we use our time, how we use our energy, how we use our personal skill set on a daily basis is going to be a big part in what that vision looks like for your people. So with that, I know lunch is right around the corner. And as a speaker, it's always the most dangerous position to be is in between your audience and their food. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say as we wrap up here, uh, Chi Miigwech, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for your attention, for your engagement. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do. I don't know you personally, but I love you for what you do for our people. So stay strong in that path. Thank you to Shannon. Thank you, Jenny, the planning committee. Uh, I look forward to seeing you this afternoon in the workshop that I have. And uh, have a wonderful lunch. I will see you soon. Take care.